You don't have to turn there, but Matthew chapter 20, there's an interesting exchange where the disciples are questioning Jesus and saying, hey, who's the greatest? Who's the greatest? I want to be the greatest. And um, Jesus teaches them a lesson, verse 25, Matthew 20, verse 25. Jesus called them to him and said, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. It shall not be so among you. And this is very... um, It's very emphasized in the original, not so among you. Like, don't do that. Don't think that way when you think about greatness uh, in the kingdom. It shall not be so among you, but whoever would be magnificent among you must be your servant. Uh, By the word, the deacon. It must be someone who serves. That's what the definition of deacon is. Whoever would first be first among you must be your slave. Even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Recognize when it comes to the kingdom of God, there is a high premium, there's a value on those who serve. The pathway to greatness is not prominence. The pathway to greatness is not being out in front. The pathway to greatness is to serve. To do the willing heart. That comes straight from the mouth of the Lord who said, I am among you as one who serves. I didn't come to be served, but to serve, and then to lay down my life as a sacrifice for many. So we always want to begin by recognizing what it is we're called to do. We're called to serve the Lord by serving others. So on page two, just want to take a few minutes on this. Three things to know, ten ten things to do. Three things to know, ten things to do. This has to do in the context of as you serve, okay? So you serve in a ministry, you lead a small group, uh, you, you're in our children's ministry, you count the, uh, the offering and assign that, uh, you, whatever, you, you clear the parking lot, you set up the tables and chairs today, any of this kinds of thing, here are three things we need to know. First of all, God created me for this. Okay, God created me to serve others. You know Ephesians 2.8. It is by grace you have been saved, by faith, and this is not of yourselves, it is so that no one may boast. What we may not know is verse 10, which says, we are God's workmanship, workmanship created in Christ Jesus for the purpose of good works that we should walk in them. Meaning God called me to himself, redeemed me, and set me on a path to walk in good works. Literally, we're created to serve. If I am not serving, I am not fulfilling one of the things for which God has created me. We are created for this serving. Secondly, God shaped me for this. What that means is that I have specifically been designed to serve God's people. And there's some ways that that gets demonstrated Uh, And it's an acrostic shape, S-H-A-P, it's like this. S stands for the spiritual gifts. The time you trusted Christ, the Spirit of God took up residence in our lives as believers and gave us gifts. I'm not just talking about natural ability. Sometimes that's an amplification. The spiritual gift can be an amplification of that. But we're talking about a special spiritual gift, an endowment from God that enables us to fulfill that calling to serve. So uh, someone may be good on their feet or good teacher, but it's spirit-filled is the spiritual gift of teaching or preaching. Some of you have the gift of administration. It means just that. You may have an organized way of thinking, and the Spirit of God equips you to help organize the work of the body of Christ, that kind of thing. The gift of mercy. You can look into a situation, you can place yourself in the other person's position and feel deeply about that person. Discerning. That's to be able to look and choose between paths. You look at a situation, you say, you know what? This person's right, this person's blowing smoke. I need to be aware of that. Some people, by the way, they are great gifts to the family of God, have a real clear sense of discernment. So spiritual gifts, secondly, is heart. Heart's simply this. What do you love to do? <laughs> you go, oh, I don't know what God's called me to do. Well, what are you already doing? What do you love to do? Likely, your calling's going to fall in those categories. Okay, so what's your heart? What are your abilities? What has God equipped you to do? That's an area where we should be serving him. Those that do the work on the building, fabulous. What a blessing. All of us here benefit from that. Those who have that ability to communicate to kids at that little level, wonderful gifts to the body of Christ. 
Your abilities are gifts from God, not just to provide for your family, not just to equip your children, but also to overflow and bless the family of God. Personality, uh, are you, uh, like my wife Vicky is more inward focused? Great, you are a huge blessing, often behind the scenes, where most of the work actually gets done anyway. Are you like me, never met a stranger? Let's get you out front. You're not going to do as much hard work as the rest of them, but you're going to have a lot of fun doing that, right? And, and that's how it's set up. What is your personality? Uh, Todd Watkins, one of our elders, tremendous ability to sort of see the steps, the next steps, great insight. Okay? I'm not real good at that kind of detailed stuff. He's a great blessing to our team, right? There's that, the ability that he has. So you can answer that. God has made me good at this for a reason, Use those abilities. Uh, personality, use the way that uh, God has shaped your personality. And then the, the final thing, the fifth thing. Uh, my spiritual gifts, my heart, my abilities, my personality, and my experience. What have we experienced in life? Uh, what have we in the past done that we say, you know, it feels like God blessed that. I've talked a lot about this with both Isaiah and Nate, our, our uh, sons, uh, because there, as they can wrestle through the call to ministry, uh, Nate, in particular, after he preached around that one Sunday morning, we talked about, well, did you feel affirmed? Did people say kind things about it? Did they feel like they benefited from that? That could be a real strong indicator that teaching or preaching is one of those areas of gifts. What are your experiences? Um, God, by the way, often uses painful experiences. So you say, well, I hosted a small group once and I utterly failed. Perfect. You may be the best experience to have a small group. <laughs> right? Moses, where was the place of Moses' failure? Dr. Hoffmeyer? Well, we, yeah, he's like, which failure? Let's talk about murder. That's a pretty significant failure. It's in Egypt. God called him after 40 years in the wilderness to go right back to the place of his failure, right? And then, and only then, when Moses was totally broken, um, did God said, now you are going to set my people free. You're going to do that, all right? So what are your experiences in life? You may have had a breaking experience in your own personal life. Uh, when my mom uh, had uh, brain cancer, we thought it was Alzheimer's, and she moved in with us, she lived with us, and, and it, we just washed her waste away, lived with us, and just going through all that and wrestling with the family through what kind of end-of-life care do you give, and, and how do you manage, you know, five kids in my family, all, very painful, and yet I have been uniquely equipped to help other families go through that, right? Very, one of the most painful experiences we ever have had. We buried my mom on Saturday, the next day I was in Melrose Park preaching, okay, 24 hours later. But God used that in my life to help prepare me for a lifetime in ministry. Some of those breaking experiences you have had, they're never wasted. That may be the very area where God's going to call you back to serve him, okay? Uh, God created me for this. God shaped me for this. God rewards me for this. I love that. Jesus said, you can't even give away a cup of cold water in the name of Jesus and lose a reward. God remembers every lesson you studied for, every time you cleaned your house because you have a small group coming over, every time you picked up the drumsticks, the guitar, the piano, set the mic, ran the, ran the video back there, of the lights, whatever, God remembers that. And he adds to this, Jesus says, and you'll not lose your reward for that. that that's an encouragement. That's a blessing. We're rewarded for this. Paul was real clear about it. He said, I strive to receive the rewards. That's a great motivation. Oh, I don't want to get rewarded. I do. <laughs> of course I want to get rewarded, and, and it helps motivate us for that. Okay, three things to know. God created me for serving. He shaped me for serving. He rewards me for serving. Ten things to do. I'm going to go through them real quick. How can I manage to do all the things in church, at home, at work that I need to do? Well, be balanced. Live a little. It's a good place to say. The preacher's saying, live a little. Yeah, well, like, have some fun, right? Be balanced in your life. Don't sacrifice your family on the altar of the church. I don't do that. You shouldn't do that either. But don't use your family as an excuse not to serve either. Be balanced in life, right? Um, have a thick skin. Pastor Larry and I were just talking about this the other day, right, Larry? Staff meeting Tuesday. We were talking about an old saying I heard years ago, Charles Swindoll said about 25 years ago. It's always stuck with me. He said, pastors need to have the heart of a shepherd and the height of a rhinoceros. All right? I would say those who serve need to do that too. All right, hear me. Ready? Okay, not everyone's going to appreciate you. You know, all God's people said. <laughs> Here's my question. So what? I mean, really, are we going to let the people that don't appreciate us send our agenda? I don't think so. 
That's right. Juan says we're serving God. That's exactly, it is the Lord Christ you serve. So let's develop a bit of a thick skin. How often on staff, right, Pastor Eric? We've got to be able to take the shots. We've got to. If we really want to do our best for the Lord, it's okay when someone criticizes, especially when it's spoken in a sense of loving me and helping me to get better. So uh, the best way I know to get a thick skin is just get kicked around a little bit and uh, figure the Lord's going to get the glory for that, and I'm going to be okay. Here's the thing that helps me have a thick skin. It's bigger than me. It's not just about how I feel. I'll take some shots. I'll do it. Because I know one day, right, I'm going to be rewarded for that. And I think it's okay to have a thick skin. Eight, handle conflict positively, which means think win-win. Um, I just had this conversation the other day on a Sunday morning with someone. It's like, look, the needs of the church are going to be put first. It's not just going to be my opinion or the elder's opinion or the, the uh, staff or the deacon's opinion. What's best for the life of the church? Think win-win. Here's how I'm going to resolve conflicts. What's the best for the church? Not do I get my way, does he get his way or whatever, but think win-win. As you inevitably, and if you're leading a ministry, it should happen, you should have conflict. If you don't have conflict, you're not leading a ministry. You may have a dead ministry floating down the river, but you're not leading one. And so when you expect conflict, you want to resolve it in a way that's healthy. What's the win for both sides of that conflict and overarching what's best for the church? Of course, what we mean by that is what brings the most honor and glory to the Lord Jesus Christ. Recruit constantly. Yeah, build a team, build a team, build a team. Delegate or die. You know how that goes. Just constantly be recruiting. Wear, wear your recruiting glasses on Sunday morning, right? When you see any given person in our room, you should be a champion. You should do like we do on staff. You argue over who you're going to get, right? And sometimes you don't know this, but some of you are the player to be named later. <laughs> it's like, yeah, well, I'll trade you a John Anderson for two Timmy Crayon Bulls, all right? And so uh, just be constantly thinking, oh, wow, that person's very friendly. Let's stick them at the front door. Or, wow, that person's so faithful. Let's put them involved. Just always be thinking about recruiting. Uh, ministry leaders in particular, train without ceasing. Right? Always be thinking, there was a mistake. How do I train? Not how do I blame someone. How do I train someone so that mistake doesn't happen again? Uh, again, I, I take this, recognize what I'm saying when I say this. I say often, if we haven't failed, we're not trying hard enough. Now, choose your fails very carefully. <laughs> but if we're failing towards growth and success, that's good. All right, so it's going to happen. Don't be discouraged by that. Learn from that. Just train without ceasing. Five, communicate relentlessly. You know, about the time you have said it, the 18th time, and you think they're sick of getting it, they're going to be like, so what I think I hear you saying is, Good, you're kind of getting through. Give them about 10 days and then say it again. All right, just communicate, communicate, communicate. Uh, demand excellence. We talk about fails, but don't be afraid then to use that as an opportunity to uh, train, to encourage, to help people, to instruct them, and we want to make sure things get done well. Uh, always, always, always we talk about it's not the easy. Easy answer is not our answer. Best, that's our answer. Now, what's the easiest way to do a thing? What's the best way? What, what most redounds to the honor of the church and the glory of the Lord, okay? A demand excellence. Hold people accountable. Uh, if someone volunteers for a ministry, that's on them. We'll hold them accountable to that. That's only fair. Um, we want to be able to say to them, we're helping you live by the agreement you made. Uh, that's how adults operate. That's how grown-ups work. That's how maturity is demonstrated. I'm willing to be held accountable. You, you who have some sort of ministry leadership, don't be afraid to do that. You say, well, what if someone that I really am trying to hold accountable quits? What do you think I'm going to say? Well, you know, behind the scenes, I might make it that bluntly, find someone else. I would say I'm going to try and instruct and encourage them. But at the end of the day, if people won't receive instruction and encouragement... What well, you've had is someone who already wasn't doing the job stepping out anyway. Right? Do we want volunteers? Absolutely. Right? There's 125 or however many is in this room. There's another, there's about 200 on any given Sunday serving. We need more volunteers. But we have to be able to hold people accountable to the agreements they've made. And I think if we train and we communicate, we encourage, they'll be willing to do that. I have found, my experience has been, the higher you raise the bar, the more you call people to a high standard, the more people like that. 
The more people are encouraged to be a part of a really dynamic ministry. So I would say hold people accountable. Two, lead by example. We don't ask people to do things we're not willing to model for them. Number one, it's just great. Serve Christ. It's the Lord Christ you serve, Colossians 3. And at the end of the day, when you're frustrated, you're ready to quit, step back a minute and say, uh, did Christ get glory from this? Am I serving him? What am I really looking for here? Am I looking for attaboys and pats, uh, pats on the back? Those should come, but ultimately it's the Lord that I'm serving. That's the higher calling that I'm serving, okay? All right, questions about any of that or an example, a story you can give us to say, you know what, I found this to be true in this example. On page three, you can look at the, there's just best practices for ministry. I'll just, I'm not gonna read, you can see that. These are, these are the to-do list. If you're a leading ministry, do these things. Let's talk about some upcoming things. Uh, page four. The theme for this academic year, and this is the behind-the-scenes theme. This is not like the most uh, inspiring slogan that I've ever had, but behind the scenes, it's really, really important. It's creating capacity. Creating capacity. So behind the scenes, you'll hear a lot about that over the next 10 months. What I mean by that is that with the building, we need to create room to expand. Um, with the various ministries, we need to create room to expand. That's what capacity is, room to grow. And then certainly within our hearts, within the, the life of our uh, walk with Christ individually, we need to create capacity, room to grow. All right? 2 Peter 3 says, Grow in grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be the glory, both now and and to the day of eternity. Amen. 2 Timothy 3.18, grow in grace. But growth serves a greater purpose. I'm not supposed to grow in grace so that I become a very mature, deep, skilled guy. I mean, I want to be those things, but in and of itself, that's not any good. It's not good for me to be those things unless I serve a greater purpose. We are to become deeper, stronger, and more skilled so that we produce more fruit for the Father's glory. I love John 15.8. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit and prove to be my disciples. So the, the, the purpose, the overarching goal, is not just faithfulness. People say, well, but I've been faithful. Well, it's good to be faithful. But is that faithfulness leading us to a place of fruitfulness? Because this, the NIV says, this is to my Father's glory, that you bear much fruit. And so out of my faithfulness is their production, is their fruit, is their life change myself and in those around me uh, with whom I serve and uh, whom I am serving. Okay, we want to bear much fruit. Our goal for this academic year, so you know, after Labor Day, right through uh, Memorial Day, is to create capacity in our building and our ministries, but especially in ourselves. So join me, our staff, our elders, deacons, in a joyful journey to greater capacity. Let's talk about that in those three areas. Let's talk about what we're going to do facilities-wise. Let's talk about what we're going to do individually in our ministries. And let's talk about our own personal lives because I think that's where the, the most upside is. Number one, we will create capacity by providing, by providing additional space. And it's just projected for you. So if you uh, need to see that, you can see that. So... Uh, we will create capacity by providing additional space. Um, yesterday, Pastor Eric and I moved our offices out of the building, all right? And we moved them to a, a little office suite over here called uh, Kingsland. It's right on Geneva Road. Uh, it's, you can walk there from here if you go out the back door. And uh, for some of you, you're like, whoa, 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 wait, Scott, you moved out of the building? Are you leaving? No, trust me. You, hopefully, you're going to carry me out here in a pine box. But um, we're here for a long time. Honestly, I've been five years in this office. It's the longest I've ever been in any office in the 12 years of this church, right? We usually, about every two years, move the office. If you've known me for a while, you've been around. Uh, who was I telling earlier today? Oh, yeah, well, oh, Phil, yeah, Lobdell. He's like, oh, yeah, two, for two years, right? You move. Um, we're doing that for a couple of reasons. Um, it now creates another conference room, so that is now uh, small groups on Wednesday nights. You can use that. Uh, deacons meetings, elders meetings. My office, my former office, uh, we're working on painting that up. We'll put a conference table in there. Uh, that's now an additional meeting room. Uh, Pastor Eric's office is going to be our finance space. Where is Melissa? Are you here, Melissa? Yeah, okay, good. 
And uh, Melissa, stand up for a minute, William. Are you already standing? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah, I mentioned thick skin, right? Uh, thank you, Eric. Um, Melissa directs our... Uh, Melissa, what do you direct? Besides Awana, yeah, I mean the administration of Awana. Financial secretary. Okay, she had to look it up too. Um, when we give, whether we give online or uh, check or cash, Melissa leads a team of however many she's got on her team of counters that uh, then receive that offering, uh, collect it. Whoops, there we go. Collect it and... Um, I don't know, whatever they do, deposit it and all that kind of stuff. So uh, one of the things, Melissa, I understand is happening, I don't know if it starts this week, but coming up, is remote deposit, okay? So we were, recently went to a new bank, and so checks and things get deposited right here. Uh, they don't have to go to the bank anymore, and uh, so that requires some security things we have to deal with. So they're going to have their own private office back there, and that's really long past due. You have a million-dollar budget and no place for the counters. Um, we want to encourage the counters, so you'll have that spot starting this Sunday. Uh, we are also renting, there's some extra space at Kingsland, so for uh, other small groups, either Wednesday night or Sunday morning, we've also talked to a local school, but haven't heard back from them yet. In other words, we're going to create some space, capacity-wise, as far as uh, the church here. Um, and I'll talk about another reason we're doing that in just a minute. Uh, Vicki, do you have the uh, building sh slides? Let's do this. We talked about this a year ago, and um, that would be an addition right out through those glass doors of just sort of kid space and some storage in that. Go to the next slide. This would be the total build out. The reason we didn't talk to it, talk to you about this over the intervening year is very, very basic to our approach to ministry. Uh, people matter, buildings not as much. Okay, people draw people, buildings don't. And last June, that is June of 2012, we went through a study with a consultant and he said, uh, let's talk about what you wanna do. And we wrote about a, a 50 page map, game plan, Included some, uh, some staff changes, included adding some staff. Um, all of those changes have pretty much been done. And uh, what we're doing now is we're turning our focus on what that build's going to be like. And so, um, I don't know, elders, we talked about this morning, we're going to talk about can we do it all in one shot. I think we do have the capacity, honestly, for that. Um, I think that uh, that's probably a year away before any dirt gets moved. But uh, I think this is something that's coming sooner rather than later, or I wouldn't have moved my, <laughs> volunteered to move my office over. We uh, signed a one-year lease with an additional year possible because I think it will be about two years to do that. All right, so we'll create some capacity. Okay, is there another, is there a, like a front? Okay, good, that's it. The other reason why we needed to move offices is that we have uh, our pastor for our new Lennox site. Uh, his name is Emmanuel Estrata. Do we have that picture? Can I show that? Emmanuel Estrata. Uh, and his wife, Melissa, and uh, their little daughter, Mariah, is four months old. Emmanuel grew up in Romania, uh, moved to Central California as maybe a six or seven-year-old, first grade or so. Um, came to Moody and met his wife, Melissa, who actually uh, grew up at College Church. Her father uh, was the chairman of the board there for a while, and uh, they still live in South Wheaton, the father does. So um, after Moody, Emmanuel and Melissa went to Asheville, North Carolina, spent four years as an associate there, and uh, he was very, 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 very fired up about this opportunity, uh, close to family, not only with the grandbaby, but also what he wanted to do. He's real young, he's real energetic, uh, loves the idea of church planning, kind of getting out there and doing that, terrific with people, and so that hire was made a couple weeks ago. They will be here, I didn't know this, they're moving up, this is this kind of Emmanuel, right? They were going to be here on uh, next Sunday, but uh, they're moving everything up. They're going to be here for the picnic on Sunday morning. So I'll make the introduction, but no other expectations on him. Uh, and uh, he will begin officially on the 7th. So they're moving in like Saturday night, be here Sunday morning, and um, he'll start on Saturday night, the 7th, down at New Lenox for us. Uh, Emmanuel's going to do six months up here, uh, even living in this area, kind of learning the ropes. We expect around March or so to start Sunday morning services down in New Lenox, so... And then, of course, we need office space for him as well. We are working on a cross. This is a little bit in the weeds, but let me just, you'll trust me, Sunday morning, you're going to totally understand why this is important with one service. We're working what's called a cross parking agreement with the printers right behind us here. There's about 85 or 90 parking spaces that uh, we're looking to have a 35-year lease to be able to share 
because businesses aren't open on Sunday mornings nor on Wednesday nights when we have our high need for parking. Um, 85 spaces, call it 90 spaces, $2,000 a space would be $180,000 to build. And uh, we're thinking if uh, God works things out, we can do it for just a few thousand dollars of uh, some um, fees and things like that related to it. And so you can certainly keep that in prayer. American Slide Charts, the name of the company. We have a preliminary, yeah, yeah, that's fine. Let me look at the paperwork. And uh, if that's the case and we get that done this next three or four weeks, that'll be a huge blessing. Uh, with Wheaton College doing baseball and stuff next door, we're kind of highly motivated to get this thing in place, locked in for 35 years. That will also meet our needs to build, uh, when we build our parking. We wouldn't have to build parking. So it's a huge blessing. All of that capacity hopefully created in the next uh, few months, certainly with the parking and additional offices. Okay, questions about any of that on the building? Okay, more, more about that probably after the turn of the year, to be honest with you. Probably everything that's going to happen this fall is going to be sort of behind the scenes, uh, boring uh, engineering stuff. So. And you engineers, I'm sorry, but for the rest of us, that seems boring. So, Live load, dead load, yeah. Yeah, all right, yeah, good, thank you. I hope there's more enthusiasm than that when we roll it out after the turn of the year. Okay, second. We will create capacity by pursuing and developing volunteers. By pursuing and developing volunteers. Okay, recruiting, pursuing. Um, we are going to be on uh, task when it comes to providing more support for those in ministry. Uh, Pastor Larry in particular has been point on this. Uh, some of you recently, I know Jarzemski, excuse me, Jarzemski's, uh, who else joined last week? Somebody else joined. Oh, the Klings, yeah, all right, Klings, others. Several have joined just for the purpose of being able to serve here. It's just fabulous. We love that. And so we are going to be on that. Um, we're going to try and get more and more volunteers. I think the more volunteers we have, the healthier that is. For every ministry, you should be rabid about that. You should be contagious. You should be a carrier of the Crossroads virus and uh, get people involved in uh, volunteering and serving. Exactly. Okay? Yes. Okay, I'm looking at my notes. Uh, so I, uh, I had the chance today. Is Uncle Robert still in here? Yeah. Can you wave at us, Uncle Robert? Can you wave at me? Yeah. He hates that. He's so shy. Uh, so today, I took my uncle to the doctor. It was a perfect doctor's visit. He got a shot, I got a sticker. <laughs> it's a good day. And, uh, but he also got a sucker, so it wasn't a total loss. And, um, and so I saw these stickers, and I asked the lady if I could have one, and she's like, really? I said, yeah, really, I would like one. It's a Superman sticker. And the reason I say that is because a lot of times when we think about volunteering, some of us think, well, if I were Superman, I could volunteer, right? I mean, I can't lead a small group. I can't teach children. I'm not Superman or Superwoman. And I want you to recognize that's, that's a wrong understanding. Um, what it takes to serve is recognize God created you for that and a willing heart. I'll, I'll grow into it. I'll risk some failures, some personal uh, embarrassment for the sake of serving. And so let's kind of lose the whole Superman idea when it comes to serving, whether it be small groups, children, music, any of those things. Um, step up and do that. And to kind of have that attitude towards recruiting volunteers. Raise the bar. Don't just say it's easy. Anybody could do it. That's not a good recruiting tack. Uh, say it's hard. Probably you'll fail, but I'll walk through it with you. <laughs> and uh, let them know what a value it is to our church and to the kingdom. And uh, do that. You don't have to be Superman. You just need to be faithful. And that results in fruitfulness, okay? Three, we will create capacity by growing in our faith, by growing in our faith. Let me just take a few minutes to talk about what that means for us personally. Next to the intake of the Word of God, nothing will help us grow more in our faith than serving. You will find yourself placed in impossible situations. You will find the unexpected greet you. You will find disappointment. You will find yourself being um, abused. I don't mean physically, I hope, but, but people can uh, say things about you that are not kind. They can misunderstand your motives, okay? Um, that's how you grow in your faith. 
I, I have to serve someone. I don't know that I can do that. I don't know the answers. I don't know what to say. You know what motivated people do? They find out the answers. They seek help from godly men and women. They take responsibility for that. And the result of that over a period of weeks and months and years is spiritual growth. Somebody took me aside Saturday night after the service in New Lenox, and they were talking about this and that, and they were really discouraged. And, you know, I just feel like I'm not getting any victory at all, and I just feel like I'm failing in this. And, I, and that's why I asked a few clarifying questions and, and I said, you know, I think you're really underestimating your own growth and uh, from what you've told me and where you're at right now. And, and he said, you know what, I've never thought of it that way. Right, well, think of it that way. There's growth. It's a process. And so spiritual growth happens when I sort of lay out, I stretch out in serving. In fact, let me give you four things that, uh, that God uses um, to increase our capacity. We're talking about increasing capacity. You say, okay, all right, and I want more capacity. How can I serve God more faithfully than I do now? How can I be even more fruitful than I am now? God uses, are you ready? This is a good one. God uses hardship. All in favor? <laughs> he does. He uses hardship. Okay, you ever go to the gym? Weightlifting, running, whatever. It's resistance. That's how you get stronger. That's how you build up your wind to be able to run more. You, you, you run through the wall. Spiritually, that happens too. Okay, you just, God's going to use hardships. We wait until we have the perfect situation. We're not going to serve. And likely, God doesn't want us serving in a perfect situation anyway. God wants us serving in the reality that we live in, hardships. Secondly, God uses irritations. Yeah, and any of you that volunteer, you're laughing right now, right? Anybody experience that? Yeah? Okay. People irritate, right? Uh, not enough space irritates. Parking around the corner irritates. Not having enough money irritates. I'm just naming the things that I live with in our church, Right? Um, Not having the right curriculum irritates. Not having enough people in my small group irritates. Being late here just happens. And God is going to use those small little irritations like sandpaper on our hearts, on our souls, to create in us more capacity. So fight through the irritations and realize God's using that to increase our capacity. Third, God uses failures. God uses failures to increase, uh, to increase our capacity. Anybody out here, uh, coach, I don't know if any of you have coached, you've coached, I don't care if it's Little League or, yeah? Denise coach, yeah, I know, right, Tony, I'm a coach, you got your son's a coach too. Um, honestly, you learn more from a win or a loss. Not even close. A lo- I can still remember the loss. I told the story here a couple months ago about the loss, you know, and like the sixth grade down over at Timothy. I, you just, you learn more in losses. God uses our failures to help us grow. That's how we learn to make better decisions, right? You make some bad decisions. And so I think the difference between spiritually mature people and those who are spiritually immature is very simple. They both fail. Spiritually mature people get up, learn from it, and go on. Spiritually immature people never get past that failure. So there are some people nursing things that 20 years ago, somebody offended them about something. You know what? Get over it. Maybe they failed, maybe you failed, it's okay. You want to be faithful and fruitful now? Leave that stuff in the past. So if you're a little gun shy saying, well, you know, I failed and so I couldn't serve, actually talk to Peter about that. He's kind of an expert on failing and one of the pillars of the church. So God's going to use our failures. So right now I'm looking, I'm saying, okay, um, I want my capacity to be increased. What should I expect? (laughs) Uh, uh, Yeah, right. But there's one other thing God uses, usually in this order, that brings us also capacity and its success. Here's the thing. Typically, we got to go through the first three to get to the fourth. God will give you success in an area of ministry, and you're going to feel really good about that. You should feel really good about that. Okay? But the problem is so many of us give up at one or two or three and a half. And then we never get to four. I began by talking a little bit about Margaret Smith, who uh, Margie played the uh, piano, or the, the organ rather. I, I left a new life in Indiana, excuse me, to uh, come to Melrose Park, and then Melrose Park we planted this church. So I had not been back to see her in 15 years. 
and there was a tragedy, and a friend of mine, his son died, and so I was back for the funeral. And just, you know, over a thousand people that had stretched the line was around the auditorium, out the door, out the street, that kind of thing, out the parking lot, rather. And so we're waiting in line. Uh, in line, we happened to stand next to uh, Mar- Mar- uh, Margie's husband's name was Dick, Dick and Margie Smith. And uh, got talking a little bit. And I had forgotten. 15 years I've been gone. My kid's been gone. 15 years. And I hadn't been in her Sunday school class at that time, so it's two years ago, whatever that is, 41 years. And um, our, our kids, Brooke and Isaiah were with us at the time, walked in, saw the Smiths, saw Mrs. Smith, saw Mr. Smith, and said, the candy man! I, I, what? What are you talking about? I didn't realize that Dick Smith, all the time that Margie was teaching the, uh, uh, teaching the children's church, her husband would just take a little bag. He's a truck driver, just a trucker. And uh, he was taking a bag, and he had a little bag of candy he'd give to the kids. They sat up if they listened, right? Think about that. 41 years ago, I was out of her class. My kids hadn't been to that church in 15 years and immediately recognized someone that gave out candy, Right? What's even more impressive is I remember the day Dick and Margie's only son killed himself. I know, because I got the call. because Our senior pastor was on vacation. I remember being at the home. The body was still there. Inconsolable parent. Only child, son, 19, gone. That's a hard day. I remember walking through that with them, the pastor, the senior pastor, coming back and preaching that funeral and just following up with them. And as we passed by, remember, I was with them in this line. As we passed by and they greeted my friend whose son had died, nobody in that crowd of 1,300 had more to say to this guy than Dick and Margie Smith. Right? Because they'd lived it. They'd been there. Their son had died probably 20 years ago, 18 years ago. There they were, teaching children's church, handing out candy. 15 years later, my kids remembered that. This is why you serve. This is why you serve. It matters what we do. Do not let discouragement stop you from that. Don't even let disaster stop you from that. It will be rewarded not only when kids see you 15 years from now and say, oh, look, it's the fill in the blank, however you serve. It'll be rewarded one day in eternity. Don't ever, don't ever forget that. Okay? Let me pray over you. And then I want to take questions from you, and then we're going to close our time by praying together. Heavenly Father, thank you for this time, for your people, or just for the lessons learned, a lifetime of faithfulness. Father, I pray for people here, some of whom have served for a lot of years. And the temptation is to be pretty discouraged or to think that it doesn't matter or just serve out of sort of routine. Lord, I pray they would feel appreciated. They would recognize how much their service means, the difference it will make this Sunday, next Sunday, 15 years from now or 41 years from now. Father, for those that are afraid, I pray that they would simply step up, risk failure, maybe embarrassment, Maybe having to learn a new thing. But the glory of your name, for the sake of growing and increasing our capacity. Um, Father, I pray you'd be honored in our lives. Help us, Lord, with uh, greater faithfulness, leading to greater fruitfulness to serve you this next academic year, I pray. And ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, questions that you